there. So we pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, Father, asking to be with us as we study another portion of your word. Father, we're so thankful that Tommy's presenting this class. We're so thankful that he's presenting it in a way that we can understand and we can apply it. Father, we pray that uh, we can get much knowledge from it, that we can apply this to our everyday lives. Father, be with us. Help us as we study. Pray, Father, that you would forgive us when we do wrong. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys very, very much. The book of Habakkuk is going to be a little bit different from some of the other prophetic books in that there seems to be a dialogue between God and Habakkuk. Now, that's not to say that God isn't uh, having a dialogue with all the others as well, but it seems like it was kind of a back and forth thing, much, much more in Habakkuk than you might read in any other of these uh, Old Testament minor prophets. Uh, chapters one and two mainly deals with the prophet's complaints and prayers. So again, think about the idea he's complaining to God, and he's also praying to God and asking for God's wisdom and God's understanding of what's actually going to happen. Again, as we go through the book, we'll see how he, like the other prophets, is very upset over the sin that his people are engaged in. Like the other prophets, he's going to be uh, looking and um, saying, Lord, how much longer are you going to put up with this? And as with the other prophets, he understands that there has to be punishment. But at the same time, he still struggles with God and struggles with the way God's handling things. And I think sometimes all of us, whether we want to admit it or not, we, we do struggle with the way God handles things. We want um, immediate answers to our issues. We want God to step in and save us a lot of times from ourselves. We, a lot of times, want to get out of these bad situations, and we just beg God's help. And God's there. He's listening, but he also has, helps us to understand what? That this old world is going to be a time of struggle and wrestling and 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 uh, fighting all of these things. So we've got to understand that's kind of the background behind it. As he's looking at it, he complains, he prays. And again, why? Judah's getting farther and farther and farther away from God. So Habakkuk uh, is contemporary with Nahum, whom we've already studied, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah. At this time, we understand that Josiah was the king. And again, he reigned from 640 to about 609 BC. And then Jehoiakim takes over at 609 to 598 BC. The main uh, enemy that is on the horizon in the book of Habakkuk is the Babylon, Babylonians. And again, as we have seen in all these, a lot of these other minor prophets, and that's the idea that God does use other nations to punish his people. And we have to understand and ask ourselves, do we see God doing the same thing to us today? Are we the people of God that we need to be? Um, could it be that we, again, are always in the middle of war because of the fact that we are not doing what God wants and what God expects. So as you look at the name Habakkuk itself, it suggests the idea of a, of a wrestling match. He's struggling. It's kind of like, uh, and I remember growing up whenever I, my dad would used to watch uh, pro wrestling all the time, and I never really got into it that much, but at the same time, and, and you think about the idea that whenever they would get into these wrestling matches, as it was, um, uh, they would be locking headlocks and they would do all this other stuff, trying to, to uh, harm the other opponent some way, somehow or another. Think about the idea of how Habakkuk is trying to understand what God is doing, but he's wrestling with it. He's wrestling with it. And again, how many of us have wrestled with some of the decisions that God have made and, and at the same time struggled with the idea of, what he is that he really wants and expects of us to do. It starts off in chapter one at verse one. And here it's so, it, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Habakkuk was upset at what he sees. And he looks around him and he says, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. 
And I submit unto you, as I've tried to all through, through this, you can't help but realize that if you're watching the news or anything like that, you'll be saying, do I get upset by what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing? Does it seem like sin is getting the ascendancy once again? Maybe I have said this before with some of these other prophets, but again, it seems to be a mantra with all of these guys and the fact that they keep saying the same thing, different mouths, different circumstances, different time frames, but they're still saying, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Are we, you know, do we have the right to ask God for help? Are we living, and this is a key passage that we will get to in a few moments, but he will be the first person in the Bible that emphasizes that we uh, are saved by faith. And he's going to be emphasizing that idea in the second chapter. And, we, and again, the righteous shall live by his faith. So the thing is, is that here he is, a man struggling with the world as he sees it, seemingly out of control. And what is it that God's going to tell him? You've got to walk by faith. You've got to do things and believe that I'm still in charge. You have to believe that I'm still doing what I think is best for the world. And I'm still going to do it to the very best of my ability. And now it's a matter of up to you, Habakkuk. Are you going to have enough faith in me to believe that I'm going to take care of things the way they need to be taken care of? That, I submit, is a challenge to every one of us. When we think, see things going the wrong way, when we get discouraged, we, give, we want to give up. And again, I think especially as preachers and leaders in the church, we see and hear a lot more than maybe the, and I understand what I'm saying, the average church member hears. And so after a while, we just, where's our faith? Do we keep our focus on God? Are we trying to solve these problems, these spiritual problems ourselves? How well has that ever worked out for us? So think about all of these things as Habakkuk is dealing with all of this. He asked the question, how long, God? shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. So he feels like that as he's praying and asking God, he feels like that this is falling on deaf ears. And again, hearing implies action. You know, if, if I hear my wife ask me to do something, that implies I get up and do what she asked me to do. Whenever, our, whenever we were rearing our children, we would expect them to do what we told them to do. You know, that's what God, that's what, that's the way God made things. So think about the idea. He's been asking God, how long had he been asking God, calling to God, asking God, how long is he going to put up with this? And again, up to this point in time, he says, you will not hear God. Why have you not done something? How many times again do we pray and expect God to give us an answer just that quick? And you see, that I understand because I've done this same thing over and over again. You probably have as well. But God is not some person that whenever we snap our fingers, he has to pay attention and do what we want him to do. In fact, if anything, the relationship we have with him is him snap his fingers and we better jump. And that's the way it should be. So he says, how long will it be? Will you not, we, and you will not say he says, we cry out to you, violence, violence of another people or because of his own people. Again, a lot of these prophets caught a lot of flack from their own followers, from their people that was listening to them. So you have this whole situation where he's caught a caught in the middle. He's bringing God's message. He's still trying to trigger, figure out what does God do here? He's wrestling with God as it was, trying to figure out all of these things, and why is it that he's having to go through all of this? He says, why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Now, this is from the English Standard Version, so maybe if you have a different version, New King James or something, you share that with us here, but he says, why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly sit, look so what is he accusing God of? Number one, you're not hearing. Number two, you're not saving. Number three, you're sitting there idle when all the world is going to, to purgatory, to hell. You know what I'm trying to say in that respect? He says, Where, what are you doing, God? 
How many Christians today again ask that question? What are you doing, God? Faith comes a lot of times, and that's where it shows its greatest splendor whenever we don't have the answers and we still trust him to handle everything. Now, before this book or this little letter is over, we have to understand that Habakkuk does change his attitude. But up front, he's really having some struggle. He's sitting, sitting there thinking, you know, God, how can you see what I see and fail to do something about it? And again, I think about sometimes in our culture, in Atlanta and so forth like that, all the things that we see, all the things that we hear, and we ask ourselves the question, why? Why do children get killed? Why is there automobile accidents? Why do we continue to sell alcohol where it's killing people right and left? More than that, why do we why do we see all these drug dealers and everything seemingly getting away from all of this other stuff? Why is there no punishment? When are you going to stop this, God? And again, remember the idea that God's going to handle it all one day and he's going to get it right. So he says, you know, destruction, violence are before me. All I see is just the, the society falling apart. All I see is all the violence. And again, as I was rereading this and rethinking about this, I was thinking about how on the last few Sunday or the last few nights that I've actually sat down and watched the news. Uh, how many times, how many people have been killed? I mean, honestly, you know, what was it? 21 just recently in one spot, 21 people. It's an amazing situation. It is, a, it is an amazing situation. Hey, Tony. Yeah, brother. Yeah, you know, I think too about where Habakkuk is here crying to God and, you know, asking how long. It reminds me of Revelation 6 when the soul's under the altar ask the same question how long the lord before you're going to avenge our blood mm -hmm. and god gives them a white robe you know in the in the image that john sees god gives them a white robe and tells them hang on i'm gonna take care of this and that's something we need to remind ourselves eventually he's gonna say hang on yeah i've got this you know and and that's something i think you brought out a couple of other times and i appreciate you bringing that out and continually bringing it out because it's something that I mean, like I said, from 609 or whatever, 640, somewhere in there, all the way to today. Think about that for just a minute. We're looking at we're looking at close to 2,000 years and things have not changed. And so there, there again, you, you see this whole situation and you keep asking yourself, and, and maybe that's the reason why, as I said before, why some people want to give up on God because it doesn't look like things are getting any better. But God is also waiting on us to do our part to make it better. Hey, Tommy. So, okay, brother. You know, think about it. You know, as we as we look at this, you know, and and you know, I went down through the verses, and you know, you know, how long? How much longer are you gonna are you gonna put up with this? Mm -hmm. But could you imagine if if God said, "Okay, you know, you're right. I'm gonna strike them dead." So you know. I'm going to strike all the sinners dead. And, and what does the Bible say? We're all sinners. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we really need to, you know, you know, as, you know, our gospel meeting went on, and then I read, read through all this, and I'm thinking, you know, that's right. You know, we're all sinners. We've all sinned. Could you imagine, you know, the first time we sin and God says, okay, I'm just going to strike you dead. Mm -hmm. We're all sinners. But I'm so thankful, you know, as you said, as you know, the book goes through, you know, um, you know, maybe I'm going beyond. But, um, you know, I believe I, if I'm not mistaken, Habakkuk, you know, when it does, he decides to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> yeah. It, it, before it's all over with, that's exactly what winds up happening. Yeah. And I'm I think that's also a challenge. Through all of this, this is this is this is a thing that I think is so important. Is it's whenever we see these things and stuff like that, it's a challenge to our faith, and you yeah. see that kind of tears us down too. And that's where he is. That's where he is. And notice he says in verse, you know, destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention. There's always somebody fighting, always something going on. Again, I I, I just sit and look at the news and just shake my head. The law is paralyzed. 
it seems like anymore, especially in our culture and in our country today, it seems like the law is paralyzed to do anything. They will not give the police officers the ability to to bring it, to enforce the law. You have many police officers are just giving up right now because of that very reason. Um, and again, uh, I've had three sons that's been police officers. And my last one, uh, he got out, he got back in, he called his mom the other day, said, I'm ready to get out again. I'm done. I'm done. I'm just done. Yeah. So you know, here it is. Habakkuk saying the law is paralyzed. Therefore, because of that, justice never goes forth. Justice is what right doing. It's not going forth because the law is paralyzed to do anything about it. Think about, again, as I was meditating on this, I was thinking about, again, uh, the federal government, the state and local governments, and the uh, lawmakers out of all of those situations. Uh, they're good at making laws, but what good are they if they're not enforced? I mean, they're just pieces of paper, and that's it. But if they're not being enforced, what's going on? And so you see, again, this fits so, so, so much with what's going on here. And he says, listen, he says, justice never goes forth. Okay, how? The wicked surround the righteous. Now, Habakkuk does say there's still some that are trying to live the righteous life. And again, going back to other lessons that we've done before, we have to realize that God always has a remnant of people that's going to be faithful. We go back even in the New Testament, he emphasizes the idea that few there be that find it. And we've stressed that idea time and time again, but this is something again that has been going on for all of this time. So as the way Habakkuk's looking at it, because God has not done anything, this is the reason why the culture has become worse and worse. We could make the same argument today. God, you haven't done anything. And God's saying, I've given you my gospel. I've given you my word. I expect you to get out there and try to help people to see what I've done to try to save them from themselves. So therefore what? You have a part in this too. It's not just me changing everybody's heart. It's all of us working together to do what we need to do. Hey, it's, Tommy. Okay, brother. You know, I was thinking too, you was just talking about he sees the wicked surrounding the just. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of Elijah when Elijah thought he was alone. And God says, I forgot the number exactly, but God talked about those who had not, you know, bowed to Baal. Mm -hmm. I still got people on my side. And right. the fact that you, you mentioned the remnant, that's exactly right. That's, that's the part we have to hold on to is that, there will always be a remnant. We want to make sure we're part of that remnant. So That's exactly true. And you know, as I'm sitting here re redoing this and teaching this again in, in, in this respect, there's just so many similarities between these and the other prophets that we've talked about. And the thing is, is it's the same message sent by different people. God is sending these different people in all these different ways, but it's still the same message. And that's why it fits so well today. And that's the reason why, again, I think preaching from Habakkuk, preaching from this to a congregation is going to be something that's going to probably, maybe with some of them, it's going to wake their eye, wake them up because they realize, well, I've never realized that this stuff was going on 3,000 years ago. So it, it is important that we emphasize these things. So he kind of complained in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He's just bearing his heart. He, he's just telling it like it is, and he's really struggling. So he says, you know what? Uh, that's that's it. That's it. So then he says, the Lord now begins to answer in verse 5. Look now among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if, if told. I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. So now God's saying, okay, you're looking at all of what's going on around you right now, but he says, I want you to look at all these nations. God uses the nations to execute his judgment. And so as God is answering Habakkuk, the first thing he says, listen, I am doing a work in your days. How many times do we sometimes think God's just up there twiddling his thumbs? God is working things out. 
Isaiah 44, 28, Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, he teaches the same idea to Isaiah as well as to Daniel. What was he doing? He was getting the Chaldeans together. The Chaldeans were going to come, also known as the Babylonians. And so he said, I'm, I'm, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. And this creates a problem for Habakkuk. Lord, I know we're bad. I know we're not doing what we need to be doing. We're not honoring you. We're not really doing what's right. But how in the world can you allow us to be punished by a nation that's, that's a whole lot more wicked than we are? And lo and behold, think again through the history of the world over the years, not only just in biblical times, but up to that point in time, how wicked nations come into being and God wakes up the world to what was going on and the world had to stand up and do something about it. World War II, Hitler, right? I mean, just, just think about that right off the top of your head. What's going on right now in Israel and, and the Hamas and all that other stuff. And everybody's taking sides in this country. And of course, seems like the ones I'm hearing more often than not is all the ones that are for Hamas, not Israel. Now, I'm not saying that Israel that we see and have and hear today are the um, same Israel that was many, many years ago, but it's still the point. It's an important point to think about in that respect. So he says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, which now leads to another question. Why does God use wicked kingdom, kingdoms rather than his own kingdom? Well, God has a certain kingdom, and again, today it's the church. Back in those days, it was the children of Israel. God did use the children of Israel to punish wickedness in other nations, but more often than not, he used other nations to punish his people, Israel, because they weren't doing what was right. Notice he says about this about the Chaldeans. He said they're bitter and hasty. They're fierce. They had a cruel behavior. They were hasty. They were impetuous. It, they trusted not so much in their strength as an army. They trusted in their battle plans. They had good battle plans. They knew exactly how to do it. They knew exactly how to make the attacks, where. They understood the ideal of rapid movement, tried to get there as quick as they could. Nowadays in our our nation, we think about Oh, well, we could just send over some bombers and, you know, we're, we're going to blow them out of the water or whatever because we're sending our bombers over. But more often than not, if you want to win a war, you've got to know how to maneuver. You've got to have coordination. You've got to have all of these things fitting in line for that nation to be destroyed. And that was literally the Babylonians at that time was the if I may compare it, the United States today with all the weaponry, with all the everything else, with all the training, with all the everything else that, that they have to be able to, to do what they can just as quickly as they can. They were the strongest nation on earth at that point in time. They had hey, the Tommy. Experience. Okay, go ahead. You know, you, to your point also, you think about when countries are in trouble, they have a tendency not to want to change anything because they think they're doing fine. Mm -hmm. You think about the history of the world, you think about the great powers of the world in history, trouble has usually come from within, but the solution has usually come from without. That's right. That's right. Happened in World War II, happened in World War I, happened all, I mean, it just continues, how history continues to repeat itself over and over and over again. He that's said, really what's going on here in the fact that Israel, their trouble is from inside Israel, mm -hmm. but their solution is coming from the outside. And that's what God is telling, telling the prophet. That's exactly right. That's right. He's going to get to that point. And these, as I said earlier, he's going to, Habakkuk's going to have a problem. Well, how can you use a nation that's even worse than we are to punish us? Well, God said, you know what? I'm doing it because you haven't done what I've asked you to do. Remember the idea that the Chaldeans had gained the independence from Assyria about the year 626 BC. 
you know, the 600 BCs, <laughs> there's a lot of dates in there that gives us the, the kings and so forth like that. But it also tells us a lot about when Babylon uh, or when Assyria conquered or Babylon conquered Assyria. Then that gave them the freedom to, for Babylon and then start uh, conquering other nations at that stage of the game. So he says they marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They're dreaded and fearsome. And their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Okay, why are they dreaded and fearsome? Because they had speed in conquering. They were able, notice he said their horses are swifter than leopards. So they have, again, in our world today, it would be tanks and, and all these other things. But think about at that point in time, those horses that's carrying, riding those chariots and their, their speed in conquering. They're seeking, notice he says, they're more fierce than the evening wolves and their horsemen press proudly on their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle. In other words, they're so swift that nobody really has time to make preparations for any kind of defense. And that's what a lot of times wins battles. That's what wins wars. Think about, again, we, we think about some of the minor, I'm using that phrase, minor wars that what in the world <laughs> I, uh, okay i don't know what that was it looked like it was raining something on me and i'm like what is going on there i'm okay all right what so, did you yeah it's like what what did you touch i didn't touch nothing i don't know <laughs> what's going on so please look like confetti huh yeah That's what I thought look like confetti i think it I haven't done anything to deserve this and, and none of us on this desk here. So go on. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Thank you for being patient. Okay. Notice he says their press, their horsemen press proudly on come from afar, like an Eagle. The Eagle swoops down on the prey before they even know it and catch whatever animal it is that they're trying to eat. So think about that as well. And again, they fly like an evil eagle to the devourer, they all come for violence, all their faces forward. Nobody's turning around. Everybody's got a mission. Everybody's got a way to go, and they're going to make sure that they do it. And they gather captives like sand. So it's not just that they're defeating the people. They enslave the people. You're now going to become ours. And then what we usually do a lot of times, especially with Babylon, they would take all the slaves back to Babylon with them because that would discourage them for even trying to go back to where they were. So all of these things just, just keeps adding up, adding up. At kings like Josiah and some of these others that the Babylonians would have had an impact with, these kings, he, they just laugh at them. They laugh at every fortress where they pile up earth and take it. What do they do? They get up all this earth and then they actually have a hill and they can go over a, a, a wall that's trying to protect the people. And they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Their strength, their power, their might. Think about God was using these guilty sinners for these purposes. And think about how God, he does the same thing today. He, he still does the same thing. We have a hard time maybe pointing to, out to it, but he does the same thing. So at the first part of it, chapter one, he complains. God, verses five through 11, then starts talking about, here's what my answer is. Now Habakkuk complains again. And he says, you know, are you not from everlasting? Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. So he, he's praising God for he knows that God is everlasting. God has no beginning. He has no end. But God's response to Habakkuk just causes more response. He don't. He can't figure it out. How can a righteous God use the Chaldeans, which is perhaps one of the most wicked group of people upon the face of the earth? How could he do that? 
So he says, how can you do that? Are you not from everlasting? Yeah. My holy one, what does that suggest? God, you are set apart. How can you use people that are more wicked than your own people to punish your people? <laughs> and that's kind of what it all boils down to. So God, I don't understand this. We shall not die. So what is he emphasizing here? Two things about God. Number one, God is everlasting, which suggests the ideal of eternal. And God is holy. Everlasting and holy. Now, how could that bring us comfort? If he's everlasting, then he's not bound by time. And he's got all the time that he wishes. Because after all, he made time. Think about that for a moment. But he's got all that time to do whatever he wishes for his people or whoever he wishes to do anything for. And secondly, think about the idea that we can't judge God because God is holy. He is set apart. He is set apart from his creation. So it's very ironic a lot of times when we as humans try to sit back and, number one, deny that God exists, or number two, we say, okay, God exists, but, uh, and I've heard people say this, God owes me an explanation. God doesn't owe anybody an explanation for anything. And so he says, Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. On the basis of who God is, they shall not die because he's giving them life. So, Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment to punish us, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. So, as he's emphasizing this, God is the foundation of their hope. And the question is, and this is a question that he really had a problem with, how can you use a wicked people, more wicked than your own people, and use them against your people? How can you tell me? Okay. In verse 12 there where it says, we shall not die. Do you think that's because he understood the promise that God had made to Abraham? Is it the fact that he knows that, that because of God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, mm -hmm. that there will be a remnant. And so he knows, he knows in his own heart, maybe that maybe the, you know, the, the children of Israel don't realize it, but in his own heart, he realizes that because of God's past promises, they were not destined, you know, they may go off into captivity, but they're not destined to be totally destroyed. And that very well may, may very well be the place because he does know that. And again, th sit and think about that as well. Notice he goes on, he says, you have ordained them as a judgment and you have established them for reproof. Now, who, who is he talking to establish them for reproof? It could very well be his people. It could very well be that he is talking about the Babylonians here, that he has established them, the Babylonians, to reprove his people. So we're struggling with that idea of exactly who is he talking about. But notice you have established them for reproof. So God was the foundation of their hope. How can you look on the Chaldeans and use them against your own people? I don't understand that, God. The thing about Habakkuk as we go through this entire book is he has a lot of questions. And he, he's at the very end of it, it's kind of like, I'm not going to say anything more, Lord. Because God finally gives him some answers that he feels like he can deal with. And so that's what we've got to consider and think about as well. So he says, you are of purer eyes than to see evil. You cannot look at wrong. And I think what he's trying to say here is, Lord, if you compare your people with the Chaldeans, they're a whole lot more wicked than we are. They're going through wiping out cities, towns, carrying people into captivity. Lord, you, you can't stand to see evil. You cannot look at wrong. So why are you using them to punish us? And I think, again, as you look at this, he's struggling his best to understand what God is doing through all of this. Just like all of us struggle all the time whenever we don't understand God and we don't understand what God's doing. 
And I think this is a, I like the fact that as, as you're reading through this, he's, he's really kind of complaining to God. We go to the New Testament, he emphasizes do all things without murmuring and complaining. But the thing I do like about this is at least by them complaining and God saying this or dealing this and, and giving us this, it helps us to understand a little bit more of what's going on behind the scenes. And hopefully it's building our faith that much more because we need that. So Lord, I, I don't understand how you do this. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Now they're getting, and now he's getting into a term <laughs> righteous and more righteous as opposed to all these other people over here. What we often do as human beings, and I think that's kind of what he's doing here, what we often do as human beings is that we compare ourselves with everybody else. Well, at least I'm not as wicked as, or at least I'm not as bad as. <laughs> and, and that kind of gives us our justification for what we do, but it really doesn't justify us. We're still doing what's wrong. We're still going to have to answer to God for what we've done. But at the same time, it maybe makes us feel a little bit better. Well, at least I haven't killed somebody or I haven't robbed somebody or I haven't done something like that. Sometimes the righteous will be caught up with wicked. Sometimes the righteous must suffer along with the guilty. And you look at the cross, that's exactly what Jesus did. He suffered for the guilty. He said, you make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. Everybody's going to get caught up in this punishment is what he's leading to. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook and drags them out with his net. So he's throwing out a net to gather as many fish as he possibly can. And in the midst of gathering all the fish that he possibly can, he's going to get some good fish. He's going to get some bad fish. What's he going to do with the bad fish? Well, he could throw them back in the water or, and I remember back reading this years ago that a lot of times the Indians would use fish to fertilize their crops, you know. So all of these things come into play here. He drags them out with his neck or with his net. He gathers them in his drag net. So he rejoices and is glad. And, and he says, you know, he's asking this question, Lord, that's kind of what seems like is happening to my people. You've sent the Chaldeans. He's bringing up all of these, all of these brothers and sisters of mine, Israelites up with a hook and with a net and, and they're all getting caught into it. Lord, why are you doing that? Why? Why are you allowing this to happen? The one that rejoices and is glad is not God, obviously, but obviously the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. So what does he do? He sacrifices to his net. You know, as the idea was, the Babylonians would have these different gods, obviously, but he's sacrificing in a, in a poetic sense to his net so that he might gain more. He, he makes offerings to his dragnet, for he lives... By them, he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? You hear what he's saying, Lord, how long are you going to put up with the Babylonians doing this? Because all they're doing is just getting slave labor. All they're doing is just stealing everything that everybody's got because of this. God, where's the justice in all of this? Why is it that you're allowing him to keep on emptying his net? And killing nations, not just few people. We're talking entire nations. God, I don't get it. And I think chapter 2, verse 1 should go back with chapter 1, verse 17. I think it's also a transition verse. He said, I'm going to stand upon my watch post, station myself on the power tower, and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. He says, you know what, I've, I've twice now, in the first chapter, Habakkuk complains, God gives us an answer. Here again, he's now making a complaint. Guess what's going to happen? God's going to give him another answer. At least God is not ignoring him. 
at least God is not condemning him for his wanting to know. I'm going to stand. And he said, I'm stationing myself at the tower and I'm going to look to see what he's got to say. I want an answer, God, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Lord, I want an answer. Well, you know, that's kind of arrogant. God, I expect an answer. I've heard people tell me that before in times past. Why did my loved one die? And, and I'll try to sit down and explain to them. Well, God's going to have to give me an answer. And I, as nicely as I can, I say, no, he doesn't owe you an answer. We do know that your loved one died because like everybody else dies. That's not going to change that. You just need to be prepared so that when you die, you'll be able to live with the Lord. God owes us nothing. God owes us nothing. And it's a good thing to be reminded of that. So, however, in all of this, God is going to answer him. And he says, <laughs> The Lord answered me, chapter 2 at verse 2. I think, like I said, the, the break should be, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 goes with the first chapter. Chapter 2, verse 2 begins the second chapter. The Lord responded from chapter 2, verse 2, going through verse 20. So let's listen to what God says. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. All right, think about that for just a moment. <clears throat> I'm traveling down the interstate, and I see these huge, humongous billboards. And these huge, humongous billboards do not have a lot of writing on it. They don't have fine print on them. They want to catch your attention. I think that's exactly what he's saying here. You make it, I'm going to tell you the answers that I'm going to give you, and we'll going to leave it at that. But you make it so plain on the tablets that if you're running by it, you don't have to stop to read it. It's going to be so big, everybody will see what my answer is. So that everybody can understand this is God's answer, not Habakkuk's answer. Write the vision. So that as you can, you're on that situation, write it. Also, he says, write it to where the man that's running can apply it to his life. The vision still awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. Okay. What vision? Well, before this is over with, he's going to be talking about the idea of the destruction of the Babylonian empire. So this is something that was going to happen in the future that Habakkuk probably would not have even seen. Actually, in 539 B.C., that's when Babylon was punished. Now, remember that he, Babylon, had taken the children of Israel, the children of Judah, 605 B.C., 597, until 586, where then all of them were taken to Babylonia. But 539, again, Babylon was punished by the Persians. So he says, you know what? It's going to seem like it's going to be very slow. When you're waiting on something, when you're waiting on Christmas sometimes and you don't know exactly what's going on, when you're waiting on your birthday, when you're waiting for all of this stuff, sometimes that just waits forever, right? Especially to a kid, right? I mean, a kid can't wait. They just can't wait. But whenever you get as old as we are now, sometimes, and I'm not going to say anything more, but but a lot of times when you get as old as we are now, it's just we've learned not to get upset. By the way, it's extremely interesting as I'm saying this. <laughs> I turned 63 today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't say that for trying to get anybody. I sure don't want no singing or nothing like that. But you know what I'm trying to say here? And I keep looking at myself. What happened? I I remember when I got married at nineteen. What what's happened here? You know, and so what do you do? You you life has changed. I mean, it's changed so drastically. It has. It has. Hey, Tommy. Yeah, brother. We had a 
new employee hired this morning and I was doing this as part of his orientation. And I realized that he's younger than my oldest grandchild. And that, that'll get your attention too. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think about some of that too, because I've seen some of those things already happen myself. I've got a grandson that's about ready to start driving. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting as well. Anyway, I brought my, I, I bring it back out of here. Don't want no, like I said, no birthday cake or nothing, but just, just to let you know, time flies, time flies. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. God will bring the sufferers through the things they have to go through. And he's going to destroy the destroyer and the people that were taken into captivity will be released. That's what he's trying to emphasize here. Notice his soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Now, this is a passage that is brought out in four other passages in the New Testament. This come, becomes a mantra as it was. In Romans chapter 1, at verse 17, the righteous shall live by faith. Galatians 3, verse 11. Ephesians 2, verse 8. Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. In this particular passage. Now, think about as well. As I said, this is written about 639 or so around that general area at that time. And he says, listen, you need to understand that you can complain while you wish, but faith is what's going to sustain you through this. Habakkuk, you don't have the right to be arrogant and ask for all of these questions to be answered. And Lord, you seem like you are waiting a long time to punish the people that are punishing your people. So Lord, why is it that, that you're waiting? And he says, you need to live by faith, buddy. When I say it's going to happen, it's going to happen. You need to live by faith. So you see, this ideal of faith is as old as God's dealing with man. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 with Adam and Eve. It was a matter of faith. When God says, don't partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They chose to go ahead and do it anyway. Satan was there causing doubt in their mind. And because that doubt overwhelmed their faith, they went ahead and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's how sin came into the world. We have the same issues today. We, a lot of times may read through scripture. We may try to the best of our ability to understand it as much as we possibly can, but some stuff is just hard for us to swallow, to deal with. I love Habakkuk's honesty. I love the fact he's trying to struggle his way through this and trying to understand what's going on. And he says, you know what? <clears throat> he says, it, God is saying to him, he said, if it seems slow, just wait for it. It's going to come. It will not delay. So he, he just stresses this idea. The righteous shall live by faith. All right. Now he goes on and talks a little bit more. Wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who's never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects all his own people. So in this whole situation, what, what, what all of a sudden does he bring out the ideal of wine? Well, I think what he's talking about is wine intoxicates, right? And they, the Babylonians, were intoxicated with power and success. They were just rolling over everybody. And they got to thinking to themselves, well, you know what? We're going to be the greatest nation. In fact, notice what he says there. He gathers for himself all nations and collects all as his own, all people. So he's running over everything. And he said, nobody's going to stop me. And God is telling Habakkuk, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. His greed is wide as Sheol. What is Sheol? That's the Hebrew word for the unseen spirit world where disembodied spirits go. Like death, he never has enough. He gathers all nations and collects all his own people. They have been intoxicated with power and success. 
They get to thinking, you know what? We don't need God. We do whatever we want to do. And God is using all of these nations. All of these nations. He's using the Babylonians to punish all these other nations. But before it's all over with, he's saying, what? You're going to be conquered as well. And notice he says, all these, all these who? All the nations that the Babylonians had conquered take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, woe to who he, who, him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? You see, I want you to notice in verse 6, verse 9, verse 12, verse 15, and verse 19, you have a list of five woes that he starts now beginning to list. So they shall call or taunt against him with scoffing and riddles, these conquered nations. All right, Babylon, you may think that you've got it and you take all the stuff that's not your own because you have this lust of conquest and plunder, but how long? Well, we don't know exactly, but God knows. And Babylon is going to be taken out of the picture. And as I mentioned earlier, 539 BC, Babylon was punished. She wasn't a nation long. Even though she had conquered, as I said, the Israelites and so forth, again, by <clears throat> um, 605, by 536 BC, it was over. It was over. They were not as long as they would have been. He says, will not your debtors suddenly arise? Well, who's the debtors? The ones that they have conquered, Babylonians. And those awake who will make you tremble. You will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you. When Cyrus of Persia entered Babylon in 539 B.C., it was about 23 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar, but it did happen. And the thing is, now the Persians are going to plunder you. Why? Because you have to be punished for what you've done. For the blood of man and violence to the earth. We've got to remember this as we think about this in this respect. We've got to remember that God is going to hold all of these nations judgment america all the nations of the earth he's going to hold them all judgment and the thing is that we've got to remember they plundered these nations so they're going to be plundered it's going to come back on them and they're going to have to pay they're going to have to pay so as if i may make a 21st century prediction as hamas has attacked israel they're going to have to pay for it and as Germany attacked <laughs> all the thing when happened in World War II, Germany had to pay for it. It's just the way God thinks, and that's the way God's going to run things. And he says, why? Why? For the blood of man, violence to the earth, to the cities. So you see, God allows all this to happen. And people are saying, where is God? God's up there orchestrating everything, making sure that everything's going to happen the way he wants it to. The only thing that we can ever hope for is for the final time, whenever he finally says, I'm ready to take my people home. And that's it. Secondly, verses 9 through 11, woe to him who gets evil gain for his house. You know, he's still talking about Babylon here. And they were building an empire on cruelty and godlessness. They were building an empire on all the gain they were getting from stealing from all the other nations. What are they doing? They're getting this evil gain. And he sets his nest on high. His idea is, is that I'm going to get up there and there's not going to be another nation on this earth that's going to be able to touch me. And again, that's what, think about that. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon had a wall around it. 11 miles long. So they actually built a wall all the way around it, 11 miles long, all right? 
the Babylonian wall that he put up was 85 feet thick. And <coughs> they actually said, and I read this, that a four horse chariot could run on top of that wall. You can actually put a four horses chariot on that wall and run around the wall of the city of, of Babylon at that time. So uh, just think about that. They had a hundred bronze gates. So this was a massive, massive wall, a massive city. And, and he's probably sitting back saying, well, you know what? I know I've done this to all these other people, but you know what? They're not going to do anything to me. They can't do anything to me because look at my defenses. And the bottom line is, is God is going to call them on it. In Obadiah 3 and 4, he again emphasizes the ideal of their punishment. Let me see. Obadiah 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the cleft of the rocks in your lofty dwelling. And you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, I'm going to bring you down, God said. And that was that very, very small book, Obadiah. So it doesn't matter what the nations may say. God's in charge and God's going to do things the way he wishes to do it. In Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 4 through 15. Uh, okay, let's listen to this very quickly. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain, and here he's talking about Israel's restoration as it was, and he taunts the Babylon, turmoil in the hard service which you were made to serve, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. The oppressor has ceased. The insolent fury ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, and struck the peoples in wrath with unceasing blows that ruled in the nations in anger with unrelenting persecution. And the whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. The cypresses rejoice at you, the cedars of Lebanon. You were laid low. No woodcutter comes up against us. She old beneath us stirred up to meet you when you come. And he goes on through the rest of this chapter, just continually talking about how Babylon was going to be punished. So here you have the same thing in Habakkuk stage, only obviously not in the same level as Isaiah goes into the deep, 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 deep details. All right. You've decided shame for your house and cutting off many people. And you have forfeited your life. So because of your violence, because of your injustice, you're going to have to pay the price. The stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork will respond. The walls are going to break. Babylon is going to collapse. Number one, he's heaped up to it the stuff of his own. Number two, he gets evil gain for his house. Number three, woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Is it not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. They built the city of Babylon with laborers. And again, life was cheap. They would ignore the misery of those employed, the conquered people. And they held life cheap. And so what does, he, what does God say? It's not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire. When people are mistreated by they are laboring for fire, for destruction. And he says, I'm going to pay, make you pay. Remember that God is the Lord of hosts. Yahweh is the commander of the heavenly armies. Amos chapter 3 at verse 13. If I keep looking down too much, I'm looking at my notes. Okay, so just, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> and here's the beauty of it. This, these people have built this town with blood, founded it on iniquity. But the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. God's special presence with his people, such as in Exodus chapter 40. The numerous texts about God's glory filling the earth, Numbers 14, 21, and Psalms 20, or 72, verse 19, and Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. 
So you built this town with blood, with the life of laborers, conquered people, but you're going to perish and the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Number four. And woe to the man who makes his neighbor drink and pour out your wrath and make them drunk. They sit and drink in order to take advantage of others. They strip them of possessions. The Chaldeans promised a lot. They stripped them of honor and dignity. Jeremiah 50, 51 verse 7. He said they do this to gaze at their nakedness. And again, whenever people are drunk, they're not thinking straight. So he said, you have filled, you're full of shame instead of glory. Writing again, still about Babylon. Drink, show your uncircumcision. Because the cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you. And utter shame will come upon your glory. You're going to pay the price, Babylon, for what you've done. And that's what he's saying. Now, you remember earlier, Habakkuk is really struggling with all of this. Lord, why aren't you doing something to save your people? The Babylonians are here. What, what is going on? Lord, you are a pure eyes to behold evil, and these people are wicked. And God is now telling him, look, I'm punishing them. I'm going to punish them. I'm going to punish them, and your shame will come upon your glory. And violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as the destruction of the beast that terrified them, the blood of man and the violence to the earth, to cities and to all who dwell in them. Babylon went through Lebanon. And supposedly, from everything I've read, one of the greatest things that Lebanon had was the cedar trees. And they literally cut them all down to use it for Babylon and their empire. And God was talking about the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. All the destructions of the, of the beast that terrified them. The animals are decimated. Why? All the forests are gone. Why? They've taken all the cedar trees. And God says, you're going to pay for that as well. And not only do you have the cedars, not only do you have the destruction of the beasts, but you're also going to have to pay for the blood of the man and the violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Wow. So he asked a question, what prophet is an idol? You Babylonians trust your gods. What, what good is that going to do you? Whenever God really judges you, whenever you're really paying the price. When a maker has shaped at a metal image, a teacher of lies, from his maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Now, God had condemned idolatry over and over and over again. Again, we could read Isaiah chapter 4, verse 29. Isaiah 44, 9 through 20. We could read that entire 11 verses and emphasize how God felt about that. Jeremiah 10, verse 15. Jeremiah 50, verse 38. What profit is an idol? It's just a piece of stone, a piece of wood, a piece of, of silver. And he says, you know what? You make a wooden thing. And, and you say to this wooden thing, wake up. <laughs> That's I like that kind of idea there. Uh, okay, you need to wake up. My wooden idol. Uh, you need to say something, do something, you know. Wake up. Say it to a stone. Can a rock teach? I mean, seriously, <laughs> no. <laughs> it can be overlaid with gold and silver, but it has no breath. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Let's take about a five minute break, okay? And all right, we all? Let's see. Okay, right there. All right. Chapter three of Habakkuk is Habakkuk's prayer. And if you look at it in uh, chapter three, verse one, he says, this is the prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigionoth. Now, Shigionoth has a lot of different ideas. Some people think it's just an instrument or possibly a type of song. 
So this would be a song or a prayer, maybe brought to song so as to maybe encourage others to pray the same prayer in, in a song fashion. So as you look at this, it's kind of like a psalm at the same time. It, it's a psalm because it is something that they would put to put to music. And again, it would give people the opportunity to remember these things. So he says, as he emphasizes this, he, he starts off by stressing, Lord, I have heard the report of you. Now, earlier, as I said, he was in a controversy with God. He complained to God. God gave him an answer. He complained a second time. Then God says, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. You live by faith. Then we come to this point here after emphasizing all of this. He then talks about how the Chaldean is going to be conquered. So now Habakkuk has changed his tune a little bit. He's, he's now praying and he says, Lord, and this is one of the most beautiful songs that you could ever possibly imagine. One of the most glorious uh, emphasis about the glory of God. So let's kind of just take it bit by bit. He says, I've heard the report of you and your work. Oh, Lord, do I fear? He said, you know, Lord, I know how great you are. And I know that 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 you have power. And, and it, you know, I fear you. And the word fear could come across with the idea of respect. It comes across with the idea of of actually quaking in your boots, fear. I think here it's more of the idea of um, um, he's singing the song, but he also is praying this prayer. And he says, I fear you. So there is that very emotional relationship that he has, but also listening to what God was saying in all of this and that God was going to take care of this whole situation. Now it's like Habakkuk is saying, Lord, I'm just going to leave it in your hands. And that's what faith does, right? It, it really boils down to it. it's just doing it. We live by faith. So what we do is just fear and, and know that he's going to make it right. He said, hey, Tommy, okay. Isn't he also showing his humility <laughs> here? After all that's after all the conversation that's going on between Habakkuk and God, that he's finally come to the realization that, you know, I need I need to accept my place in life and let God take care of God's stuff, you know. And this is the greatest lesson that I think this book teaches. We can pray, we can complain, God can handle our complaints. Though, again, the uh, Bible does emphasize do all things without complaining or murmuring. But, you know, there are times we see it here with Habakkuk. We've seen it with some other prophets as well, where they do complain, where they're sitting there thinking, Lord, what are you doing? And, and again, God can handle that. Just as long as we don't lose faith over it, just as long as we're not questioning how he does these certain things, we, we need to understand that he could do that. All right. So he said, in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So God, you have sent the Babylonians to punish our people. We have been punished and we deserve it, God. But Lord, Please remember mercy. Please be merciful to us. And again, it's a beautiful psalm in that respect. He's asking for mercy for his people. Then he's going to, before it's all over with, he's going to ask for another invasion only of Babylon next time. Hey, Tommy. Yes. <clears throat> also, you think about that in wrath, remember mercy. You think about the end of time, you think about judgment. We all deserve what we all deserve God's wrath. Right. But we know that as his as his children, if we're faithful to him and, and do his and that's what Habakkuk's teaching us here. But if we do what God says do, we know that the mer the mercy, you know, he's still merciful. He's there's some that are going to obtain mercy, even though we deserve the other end of it. So right. That's exactly right. So it's, that's the beauty of it. And I think that's what he's asking for. God, please. And, and think about some of the complaints he's made. 
And he probably feels like, well, you know what? I shouldn't have complained as much. God's got this. So why am I getting upset about it? So I think there was hopefully also not only the plea for God to be merciful to him, but also awakening it up as it was an awakening in the fact that, okay, God is not like I first judged him. He's going to do what's right. He's going to do what's best. And so I need to trust him and believe on him in, in that respect. So <clears throat> he's going to now talk about verses three through 15, the idea of God's saving acts, how God has saved others. Now, as we look at this, he's been asking for this. He's, he's thought all this book has been about Babylon and what they've done to his people. Now he's saying, God, please be merciful to all of us. God came, came from Teman. All right, Teman is another word for Edom, the Edomites, okay? So just keep that in mind. And the Holy One from Mount Paran. Mount Paran was west of Edom. And so there you have that Selah. So let's, let's notice what God did when he came down. <clears throat> his splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Again, think about how many times through scriptures that we see a lot of these prophets that come into the throne room as it was of God. Revelation is very, very, very much filled with that figures and a lot of these figures that we read in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, Isaiah actually comes into the throne room of God. Here you have Habakkuk in the throne room of God as it was. And he's he's talking about how great God is. His splendor covers the heavens and, and the earth, the entire earth, every person, every being on this earth is full of his praise. His brightness is like the light. Rays flash from his hands and there he veiled his power. We can't see God. God is so holy, we will die immediately. And that's why over and over through the Old Testament, God is always, as it was, hiding himself. In the temple, he's hiding himself by the curtains and so forth, because you cannot be in the presence of the holy God. And then <clears throat> he he's raised flesh from his hand, his brightness like the light just praising and talking about how glorious he is. And then key in on the idea before him went pestilence. Well, when did that happen? Well, in Egypt, <laughs> whenever he delivered his people out of Egyptian bondage, was there pestilence in wilderness? Yeah. Many, many of the, all of that first generation of Jews that left Egypt died in the wilderness. And then think about the ideal of how it's happened over and over again throughout the land of Canaan. So this was something that just went on and on because he used this and plagues to follow at his heels. So <clears throat> as you're looking at all, all of this, he is saying, Lord, I know how great you are. And, and I know this and, and, and Lord, you, you've come down and you've covered the heavens and you're, we're praising you. And, and all of this went pestilence. We deserved it. He stood and measured the earth. His presence filled the earth. When he's measuring the earth, is he measuring the actual dimensions of the earth? No, he made it. <laughs> he's measuring the people on the earth. There's the ideal of judgment there again. <laughs> and he talked about earlier the pestilence and the plague that followed. All was done to punish the people of the earth that were not trying to do what God says. And he stood and measured the earth and he looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. Well, did that actually happen? Was he bringing nations down? Was he creating earthquakes and causing the, the world just to <laughs> give up as he knew it? Think about the idea that he presence filled the earth and he had the right to make everything the way it was on the earth. And the eternal mountains were scattered. A lot of times mountains are used to describe nations, right? So keep that in mind as you're reading through this, the poetic frames of it. And the everlasting hills sank low. So if he is talking about in poetic terms, these nations, what's he saying? They come and they're gone. 
And what can we say about God? God's ways are everlasting. Hey, Tommy. Go ahead. You think, you think also about the fact that even if this is in a sense a physical reality, you think back to Korah and how the earth opened up. So God, God has always used even his own creation to accomplish his will. I mean, that's just, that's just his, that's his knowledge, his power and his ability. And so it should not surprise us if there was actually some earthquakes or something like an earthquake to help, you know, help bring about what he wanted done. That's exactly right. And you make a very, very valid point. Cause like you said, he's done that over and over and over and again. And so, <clears throat> but a lot of times, again, this language does suggest not just earthquakes and all, it suggests the shaking up of nations. So I think we have to look at both of these situations. <clears throat> and I think especially in this context, he he's going to start talking about Ethiopia. He's going to start talking about Edom. He's going to start talking about uh, the Babylonian invasion. So I think it's more not so much of his redoing the actual mountains as much as he's redoing the nations that's my opinion okay <laughs> all right so and again i don't, don't begrudge you at all with yours as you look at it in that respect either way he's in charge verse seven i saw the tents of kushan in affliction kushan is another word for ethiopia Ethiopia was also known as Cush. Cush. And he said, in the land of Midian did tremble, which again stresses the idea of probably nations. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? No, it's not, it's not against God's creation. It's against the instrument of wrath against the wicked. God sent these rivers of anger as it was. So think about <laughs> what happened at the Red Sea with Moses? And again, all that's going on there. Think about how the Nile River, the Jordan River, all the events that took place in every one of those rivers. Was your wrath against the rivers? No, it's, no. God's not angry at rivers. Rivers are doing exactly what he wanted them to do. He's upset with the people. And he says, you know, on your indignation against the sea. <clears throat> when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation. Your chariot of salvation. Hmm. Back to Psalm 77. In the book of Psalm 77, he stresses the idea of God riding and, and judgment upon all the nations again. So he says, I cry aloud to the Lord in the day of my trouble. I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. He says, my soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan and I meditate. My eyelids are open. <clears throat> he says, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. <clears throat> will the Lord spurn forever? So he said, I'm going to say verse 10, I will appeal to this and I'm going to wait for the years of the most high. <clears throat> Lord, I will ponder your works, meditate on your deeds. What God is like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the people. You arm your children or arm redeemed your people. And he says, when the water saw you, they were afraid. The deep trembled, the cloud poured out water, skies gave thunder. Crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Lightnings lighted up the sky. See, God did all of that. And I think as I'm reading Psalm 77, I'm seeing that every one of these things that the people were able to see at that time, they should have been reminded of God. I think about how in the middle of a middle of a thunderstorm, I'm reminded of God. Um, I think I've shared with you before, I've been up close and personal with Latin a couple of times. And uh, it's not nice. <laughs> in, in the least little bit, it's not nice. And the thing is, is that, okay, God, you got my attention. <laughs> yeah, I won't go outside in the morning in the middle of no thunderstorm, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. So, okay, Lord, thank you. Notice he says, you strip the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. 
And again, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, 40 and 42, where he talks about calling arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountain saw you and writhed. Here's the thing. Rivers, hills, mountains, all are obeying God. Sun, moon, storms, all of these things. Again, read Isaiah 13, 9 through 13, and Joel 2, 1 and 2. So you, you see how they're writhing, and they're all doing it because God told them to. Whenever Joshua was fighting in a battle, it was about getting dark, and Joshua pleaded for God for more daylight, and what happened? The sun and moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows as they sped, as the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. There was a purpose in all that God had done. And what, what was the thing that he was striving to do more than anything else in all of this? Save his people. The salvation of you're anointed. You crushed the house of the wicked, Egypt. Laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the head of his warriors. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of many waters. I hear my, my body tremble. <clears throat> my lips <clears throat> quiver at the sound. The rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. As he describes the Babylonian invasion, Habakkuk was excited and he's agitated. There was not calmness and faith because he saw all what Babylon was doing. But through this, he had the ears of a waiting servant. He was seeing through the eyes of an honest inquirer, and God was trying to comfort him. So he's telling him, in essence, Habakkuk, don't worry. <clears throat> I've got this. If I can make the mountains, if I can change the rivers, if I can do all of this other stuff, <laughs> this Chaldean nation is nothing. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to get upset about. It's nothing. So here's a God who's given him a message. And Habakkuk goes from complaining and wondering where God is in the midst of this to having his faith increased. He began the book by informing God how to run the world. Okay, didn't work out too well for him. <clears throat> but he ends by saying, you know what? God's got this. And I'm not going to worry about it. <clears throat> he trusts God knows best. He trusts that God will bring about justice. And so at the very end of it, in a beautiful, beautiful words, he said, if the fig tree should not blossom, <clears throat> nor fruit be on the vines, if the produce of the olive fail and the field yields no food, he said, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herds in the stalls. There's nothing to eat. I'm going to continue to rejoice in the Lord. You know, that's a tough decision to make whenever you're starving or you might get to that situation where you might starve. Where's God? How many times has that question been asked? But what's Habakkuk saying? Well, after going through this entire book and having this discussion with God about the way things are and the way Habakkuk thought they ought to be, he now has enough trust in God that God's going to handle it the way he needs to handle it. And so should it be. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. <clears throat> I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God is my strength. I'm not going to trust me in trying to get all this stuff taken care of. 
Lord, I, I complained earlier, but you know what? After talking with you and all these things, where I've wondered where you were and all this, and you've shared with me this, then Lord, all I've got left is trusting you. God is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. <clears throat> so this becomes a song because it closes with the ideal of a choir master with stringed instruments. You have temple musicians that's mentioned in Psalms 4, 5, 6, 9, 8, 9, 11. And it would be a prayer perhaps that would have been sung by everybody that trusted God. So if there's one real lesson that we've got to remember from the book of Habakkuk is what? God can handle our complaints as long as we're not sitting there blaming him for everything. I believe that. Number two, God's got this always. He's got this. No matter what goes on in our lives, as I shared with some of you earlier, another event that's going to be happening in my life, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, okay, everything's spiraling out of control here. And I, I, I'm i just, okay, whatever. And now it's, I've enjoyed studying Habakkuk this last week and a week and a half. You know what I'm trying to say? Because it's meaning a lot more to me now than it ever would have meant any other way. God's got this. I don't know how it's going to play out. I don't know how everything's going to work out, but I believe beyond any shadow of a doubt, God's got this. And what else can we say? Not one single solitary thing. My voice is gone. I keep, <laughs> keep all this other stuff and I'm going to give myself a little bit of a birthday present and head on home. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. So next week, Happy birthday, brother, by the way. I appreciate that. I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, Happy birthday. So, thank you. Uh, you know, 63. I never I never dreamed I'd be this old. But you know how that goes. Um, let's see. We are October. We're not November, Tommy. So we cover Habakkuk next week. We will cover... We'll get into Zechariah, and if I'm not, yeah, we'll get into Zechariah. If I'm not mistaken, we're going to try to do two weeks on that one, right? We talked about that earlier. Yeah. Okay. And then the next Thursday will be Thanksgiving, and we should be able to finish up everything. You're going to try to do Haggai and Malachi on the same night? I might do that, yeah. Or if not, um, let me know. Like I said, I th this thing has changed so many different times through the course of this qu quarter or semester. One other thing that we might do, and again, I asked this question to begin with, but Mike has a uh, Mike Bisson has a class on Tuesday nights. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Mike, when is your class over? On Tuesday night. Oh, because well, he ex he extended it because we were stuck in chapter three. Oh, he extended the class, huh? Yeah, because he oh. said, "Well, we 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 got to get through chapter three, and if we don't fully understand it, we can't go on." <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I'm not teaching that class. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and this last week he. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this last week he was he was real sick. Yeah. So I know, he's I've been in touch with him. Uh, yeah, I know what you're saying there. So we'll see. Well, if you go, if you go the two weeks before Thanksgiving and do Zechariah, and then take the two weeks after Thanksgiving, we'll still we'd still be done like a week or two weeks before Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. If that if that works with everybody else. Right. And the thing is, is we're supposed to go for 18, no, not 15, 15 weeks. And I think we've gone beyond 15 weeks. Uh, I'm looking back at my calendar. We started back in August. And if I counted right, the 15 weeks is the 15 weeks. Well, it was the one week he was at the gospel meeting. <clears throat> right. 
And another thing that threw it off was my not being able to do it for two weeks. So that's part of the reason why that got thrown off. So next week we will go through Haggai and I may, I may jump from Haggai to depending on how long Haggai takes and Malachi, we may do those two and then we'll cover whatever we have left with Zechariah in two classes possibly. How about that? Sure. Okay. All right. So please remind me if that's what I said. So you're going to do Zechariah the next two classes so that you got those two out of the way and then do Haggai? Malachi? I think so. Let's do Zechariah the next two classes. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think that that way it'll give us a good break. Break at Thanksgiving. Break at Thanksgiving. And then we'll do that last class the week after Thanksgiving. Okay. okay. All right. We can finish right. the last two books. We should be able to cover Haggai and Malachi the same night. Yeah, shouldn't be no problems whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, we thank you for helping me work this out, and we'll do that, and I'll do that. Absolutely, that'll work. Yeah, yeah. So thank you guys so much. Appreciate you. Pray for me and uh, <laughs> my family, and uh, keep us in your prayers always, always. And um, I appreciate all of you so much. Let's close with a word of prayer. I thank you, Father, so much for the day. I thank you for this blessings of being with, with my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm just so grateful to you, Lord, for every blessing you, you bless us with. Keep us in your care, Father. Forgive us of our sins. And Father, thank you. Thank you for these words. Help us to trust you and not us. Thank you for the George School of Preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm. All right. <clears throat> so you're thinking what, what what the next next time we're, we're going to continue on Thursdays, correct? We're going to continue on Thursday. What's yeah. going to happen? We've done Habakkuk. Next week we will do Zechariah, and the week afterwards we will do Zechariah if it takes two weeks, and then we will skip Thanksgiving and Malachi and Haggai on the thirtieth. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. That be it. Work. Right? That'll work. All right. Thank you. All right, let's have a good week. <clears throat> All right. Y'all take care. Now we meet again. All right, brother. Hang in there. Bye-bye.